That's the best it's going to get. Yeah, we know that, right? Yeah, all right. <laughs> We're not uh, who's, who are graduate students in here? How many graduate students today? Any undergraduates? <laughs> and then faculty? And then the old school of education? And the graduate students, what program, programs in general? Right. Learning sciences. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. I'm trying to get my stuff much better. So then we, as usual, got too much to talk about and uh, not enough time. So our work really has been basically uh, it's a big transdisciplinary group. What we're going to do today is our agenda uh, moving relatively swiftly. Just a little bit of foundations and perspectives about where we come from and what we're interested in and why history, uh, and then thinking about kind of that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the trajectory of our work that deals with AR and, and, and virtual reality. And then we're going to do a deep dive into an NSF funded grant that we had that was looking at a, uh, well, it was called CI Spy. And we'll kind of get into that. It was a, basically a hidden history uh, uh, around the central of the American school in, in the local community uh, using mixed reality to do that. So that's the plan. So the first bit is like sort of uh, our, in a sense, um, just some of our basic foundations. And this book, has anybody read uh, Gaddis's Landscapes of History? Okay, so that has, that's had a very kind of powerful impact on just how I think about uh, history representation. And just the idea that um, just taking that almost like bird's eye view and being able to recognize the, the unfamiliar from a different angle, kind of shift the gears, new perspectives that to appear. And uh, on the front, you've got uh, Friedrich's uh, The Wanderer. And it's this idea that, you know, this, this, you know, we're trying to, in a sense, make, make, a, make it something curious. We want a sense of curiosity. We want to do representations. We want to penetrate into what is not always clearly visible. And so that had a, a nice ring to us. And he talks a lot about the landscapes of history and the idea of, like, maps. And maps are um, representations. Sometimes the first maps are not very clear and pristine and then you develop over time as, as, as uh, you become a little bit more uh, refined about things. And we, uh, our team spends a lot of time working with human-computer interaction, people in the School of Visual Arts, public historians, um, what else, instructional designers, education people, and things like that. And it's the idea of like still trying to, in a sense, ourselves navigate and negotiate ways to use digital technology technologies, and especially augmented reality and virtual reality, in the field in the sense of history around. Uh, so shift the gears, new perspectives appear is one thing that we're playing with, and Gaddis also talks about um, Shakespeare's Viola, you know, it's uh, when she's on the, on the kind of on the beach, not sunbathing, but she's like, you know, what country friends is this? And that question has kind of had a lot of resonance to, to what we're do, what we, we are doing, because it's a lot of place-based work that we're doing. And often the question that we have, or the compelling question that we ask around all this augmented reality work is, if this place could talk, what would it tell you about? So similar to Viola's oh, country friends, is this? So one of the things that I do like to point out, and this is the one, I won't jump to it, but this advert drives me mad. Have you seen this advert? Yeah, about two years old now. And it can even change its coming. The surface, flat. Ooh, change has come in, and they can even do homework. <laughs> right? It's the same type of adverts that you get where everybody's just dancing and things are flashing around, and you actually go, what's the, what's the point of what, what's here? It's very sexy. Lots of farts and flashes, but it really is not giving you much to it. And so we recognize, so we're not techno, we'd like to think we're not techno romantics, but we play with things a lot, but there is no panacea for the challenges. And one of the things I spend a lot of time doing working with HCI guys is say, well, let's think about learning. How can we actually think about this to support learning? And recent uh, reimagining role of technology education actually does talk a lot about learning principles, transcend specific technologies. And so let's put a focus on that a little bit. And some of my work uh, prior to this has been thinking about learning. A long time ago, we wrote an article in an website guide uh, about constructivism as a theoretical foundation for uh, using technology uh, in the social studies. And that basically came out of the fact that people used to walk around going, I'm a constructivist. I'm a constructivist. And that, and it, it didn't, it sounded cool, but nobody really knew what it meant. And no one really was willing to read anything about constructivism, just like, like the term. So we've kind of spent a lot of time thinking about learning and laying out some plans of like, what do we think technology could do to support learning in different ways? 
And then why, why is context important? We also push against this a little bit we're going to talk about, but constructing prior knowledge. How can we do it almost engagement first, where we want children not to know much and then to use the technology to extend their knowledge rather than relying on something from the past. So we'll play with some of those ideas. And we've spent a lot of time using strategic thinking and scaffolding within the technology itself. So how can we embed, embed um, waste of process information within the technology? So that's kind of one of the kind of places we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to use some technologies. Makes reality. I have no idea what it is. Yeah. So and you'll keep you. doing the quicker. Can I do this? You, unless you show me how it's to use It's mine. It. No, it's awesome. I'll just keep okay. clicking. You go. Back and forth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a lot of what we're doing is grounded in how these tools can be in affordance to get us toward a outcome we're looking for, rather than a hammer that we're trying to apply to a problem we can find. And uh, Dunleavy and Didi have done quite a bit of work in augmented reality. I'm sure those of you in uh, areas that look at that or familiar with that work, go ahead. Uh, we wanted to do, before we go into a deep dive on the Christiansburg Institute project, wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the trajectory of our work over the last five, six years. Yeah. When you uh, had hair, remember? Yes. Back in the day? Yes, I had several <laughs> at this yeah. point. And we were sat around chatting one day, and um, I'm from Instructional Technology and Design, LST, I, however you'd like to phrase it today. Um, my work was uh, based around virtual reality years ago, and I was interested in how we could use augmented reality for place-based learning, the context part that we're talking about. And I love history, and he's a history guy. So we got to chatting, and we were aiming, I was aiming a little high, and he grounded me and said, hey, we need to do something we can actually do to get started. So we made a augmented reality walkthrough of our campus. Very basic, but it was functional, and it gave us a, a first stepping stone, just an informational thing. From there, we went on and did um, a project around a small disappeared African-American community in our, in our town onto this NSF-funded project that we'll be talking about more deeply, and then work with other sites as well, a federal agency who um, takes care of the war graves across the globe for American soldiers, um, a, a historic um, farm and plantation that's near our campus in Virginia, called Smithfield, which we integrated a um, classroom-based learning project around, um, an augmented reality and projection mapping project around the 16 squares, the original 16 squares of the small town that we're in, and most recently a fairly big project that we're still working on around a World War I battlefield where we brought together engineers, artists, um, archaeologists, historians, us, we're the, you know, the, the comedy duo of the truth, <laughs> to Style. build this representation of this place. So let's go ahead and go on to the video. And I'll, I'll talk a bit, but I'll try not to talk too much over this. What we'll be starting with is the 16 Squares project. And um, the technologies that were put to use here are some of the same ones we use on other projects. Um, initially, it was to get a terrain model of the town. And so we did that using a drone and a technique called photogrammetry, which is simply a stitching together of a collection of photographs to make a 3D model. And so it flies over the town. It takes hundreds of photos and turns into this first Mr. Rogers type view <laughs> of the town, which then art students worked on um, through their process of um, working on other photographs to rebuild very, very high fidelity models of the buildings themselves. And this project went on to incorporate some 3D printing and um, CNC machining of a terrain out of uh, foam material, and then a projection of animation okay, so and a film. It's a place-based study of uh, trying to make the um, invisible visible. Everybody's walking around Blacksburg. You kind of just get a feel of what's there. We want people to understand that there's a history behind it. I walk down these streets all the time, kind of giving me a new perspective of the town as I'm walking by. And that's the purpose of this project, is kind of bringing the visible history of Blacksburg into the visible, and giving the viewers a new perspective of the town in general. You get, a, you get the essence of to this time, continuity, and change in this place, and it's more than just looking at tech. So one thread that you'll see we'll talk a little bit about as we go through the various projects is how we try to incorporate the um, 
project-based or classroom-based learning opportunities for the students, get them doing the same things that we do. This is the little project that we got started with. Um, we used a development kit called Layer to basically make a map of the campus. So you can take an iPad or a phone, an Android phone, an iOS device, and look through it in sort of a magic window way. This was some of the earliest type of AR available, and it identifies the buildings. So you can look across the campus and it has a pin that shows what the name of each building is and it gives you information about that building and directions to get to it. This was a, a project in 2014 where we um, accompanied a uh, program to build curriculum around teaching World War I history in American middle and high schools and uh, tagged along with, took a uh, visual arts person with us and did some of our earliest laser scanning work to just try to test what we might be able to do to create reconstructions of this place. And this is just some of the data from that. Uh, this is a recent exhibition of some of that work on campus. Um, what you have there is we had 360 video of the site that's on this circular screen at uh, Virginia Tech's ICAT building. And it's kind of washed out in this light, but there's video playing around you. And then centrally, there was a model that uh, animation telling the story of the change over time at this small village in France went over. This is uh, folks on that exhibit day going through our virtual reality reconstruction of some of those tunnels um, and a reporter uh, going through it as well. This is a short demonstration of what that uh, tunnel looks like in virtual reality. Um, we have a, we, we are developing a physical tunnel to go along with this. That's quite a, um, <clears throat> quite a piece and is not incredibly portable. So it takes a, a planned exhibit time and space to set it up. But, um, this is a walkthrough of a section of the tunnels that were scanned and we placed, uh, various objects in it and we have some narration and some other interaction opportunities to give people a sense of what it was like to be there. And what's happening here is working with some computer science folks, we uh, implemented a technique called redirected walking in virtual reality where this gentleman is in a small square room that's represented in that picture by that translucent box. And he's only walking back and forth about 15 feet. But in virtual reality, he feels like he's actually traversing about 45 or 50 feet because he's able to move across the room, but when he is turning to what to him feels like 90 degrees virtually, he's actually turning all the way around mm -hmm. and just walking back to where he started. So that's just a little trick that you can use to let people feel like they're really physically traversing a much larger space than they are in reality, which is um, an important piece for that um, experiential part of it. Do we lock up or are we uh, at the end? Okay. So go ahead to the next slide. Right. So a lot of it, though, then, is this idea of making the making the invisible visible. People don't have access to the World War One mines and uh, uh, Vauqua, which is just outside Verdun. And so it's the idea of like creating that experience. And also even the LIDAR, when you saw the, the kind of um, the mines and the galleries, you know, one of the questions we have is if this place could talk, how can it tell you that the war wasn't going to last four years? Or it was going to last four years. It wasn't going to be over by Christmas. Mm -hmm. And the idea of just entrenched. And so these are often very quick aspects to a, to a classroom and not the whole thing, but we give them this chance to go through that. And there is narration. We have a narration built around what people are seeing and what they're experiencing as they go through uh, the tunnels. The deep dive is the one we spent most of the time with, and this is a uh, CI spy. It's an augmented reality in a sense to help support historical inquiry. Um, it's a fifth grade curriculum, and I'm going to let you carry on and just talk a little bit about the cyber learning stuff. Mm -hmm. So this was funded by the cyber learning um, program at NSF because it was based around teaching inquiry. It wasn't um, initially on our first proposal or two, they thought we were just wanting to teach recall of facts and dates. And once we were able to communicate to them that we were really talking about teaching an inquiry skill, all of a sudden they were on board. Yeah, it took two, three attempts to get the yeah. in the first place. So I feel like it was quite a stunt to pull off a humanities-funded NSF um, learning um, experience. But we, we managed to do that. But as David alluded to earlier, we were trying to use the technology itself as a scaffold, coupled with his SCIM-C scaffold, 
to teach these children the process of historical inquiry, not just the dates, facts, figures, names, uh, numbers of the place itself. So go ahead. Um, really, again, it was about our thesis that the context, the place was important. We had a, a virtual reality um, aspect to it as well, partly because, frankly, we had a very large transdisciplinary diverse team and our uh, human computer interaction folks really wanted to do a virtual reality part of it as well. So we did that. Yeah. It was um, moderately disastrous. Terrifying. Um, <laughs> took it into the classroom and the kids just went wild because they know how to play games on an iPad really quickly. So picture this, so it's in the classroom, they're at the site, they've got the, they've got the iPads in front of them and they're literally trying to jump over walls, yes. trying to ex break it. Yeah. And there. it was a substituting. Yes. And we're highly trained at nothing. Right. And so literally- <laughs> I just sat in a rocking chair. Yeah, you were. Really I rocking. was in a fecal, yes. I was doing this too. Anyway, so it was like, but they literally <laughs> took the, their understanding of gameplay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just started running around crazy. And yes. all the kind of cues and things and the sources we thought that we put in and that, it was out the window. Out the window, gone. Absolutely gone. And so, so, gone. so really, but that wasn't, that was somewhat of an expectation of ours, but our, our point was about the context itself, the place, and bringing this information to the place. So um, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Yeah. Again, we had this diverse team. We had um, the, our, our, our PI was the computer science person. Our postdoc was a computer science person. But really, it took the instructional design, the historians, and our folks with actual experience and knowledge about how things will work or not in the classroom, which was our target, to make this thing happen. And we also had, uh, we partnered with Montgomery County Schools, and they had a fifth grade curriculum. And so they would sit in the meetings as well. And so, yeah, you want to just say a quick word about my place and time and space? That yeah. So they had a fifth grade curriculum, they had some freedom, and they developed this um, course called My Place in Time and Space, Local History as a Portal into National History, uh, and also skills of the discipline. So a lot of disciplinary skills, how you work with sources, how you work with maps, that type of thing. And I'd, I'd help develop that. And so he said, well, maybe we can do something with this one site that nobody really knows about, Christiansburg Institute, as a place for a kind of disciplined inquiry to bring, bring all that together. So then we had to get buy-in from the teachers. They'd come and advise what should go in, and they gave us some of their materials they've used in the past, mm -hmm. and these were some of those type of things. We mm -hmm. took them out on a field trip to show what we got. Yep, they did some pilot testing on the site with us, and we'll explain what you're seeing there as we go forward. It so. literally is a field trip to a field. Yeah, it's a trip to a field. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no toilets, <laughs> Correct. apart from around the back <laughs> right. of that one, and it's the color right. wall. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the technical aspects of CI Spy for you. Um, what you have here is um, historically African-American school that ended with the end of segregated education. Uh, it has, it is a portal into national um, history. It had, uh, I don't wanna skip too far ahead, but you know, we have Booker T. Washington involved in it. This is in a small hamlet in Southwest Virginia, which is truly the middle of nowhere. But here you have uh, a dilapidated building in a field that people drive by daily, they know nothing about. Um, so it was a real opportunity for this place-based uh, augmentation, really, and in, in the in the pre-augmented -augment, reality uh, way of thinking of it, of bringing the information, the data out to the place where the history occurred. Go ahead. Do a quick video. Yeah, here. this is a just little video. It. This gives you just a nice, quick overview of what was going on. Technology to bring history to life while they take control of what they find. Institute. If the remaining two buildings of the historic Christiansburg Institute could talk, raise your hand if you want to peek inside. These Auburn Elementary students might know what they were saying. I think it's kind of cool that we're actually not building outside of it right now, and that we get to use the talents to see where the other buildings were in the past. How about you click on that junior detective? The fifth graders are testing CI Spy, a new mobile software app designed by Virginia Tech researchers. The students are able to look through the lens of their iPad computers and see the campus as it once stood. It uses augmented reality to give them the ability to see the now boarded up and gray Hall building as it appeared decades earlier as an African-American school. Embedded in some of these buildings are pieces of evidence that tells them about the lived experiences of students here at Christiansburg Institute. Students dig into the past with every tap on the screen. 
they are the ones that are in control of their learning. So it really is an authentic way of learning and it's a meaningful way of learning. Of course, it incorporates, you know, cutting edge technology that the kids love. 1951, CI. They can see pictures from the past. Here, former students share their experience and read documents students once used. So um, we were incorporating a couple of different uh, techniques to do the augmented reality here. We were leveraging a development environment, which then was purchased by Apple and is now what AR kit is. And so things went dark for us for a while with the way things work because it became unavailable. But we've managed to retain four working iPads um, out of the 30 that we have. Um, but what's happening is the, the just typical location awareness aspects that all these uh, handheld devices have, we use that to put the buildings that used to exist on this campus in place around you and also to provide a peek into the building that's boarded up where we place evidence about what this place was. Go ahead. And the real, the real point here was uh, David alluded to engagement first earlier. Uh, we had a five-day curriculum really developed mainly between us and with consultation with the teachers that was paced such that they, uh, the students weren't given the entire answer to what this place was about before they went out there. The, the idea of the trip to the field wasn't a fun icing on the cake day. It was really the part to engage them in the material and get them off on this We didn't want journey. them to know that this was not, it, our goal was if they can come away and say, this is an African-American school. This is what they learned. This is what it was like here. I didn't realize that. And it's in the middle of nowhere. And that's one of the things we wanted to come away with, not to know, know it. And then everything else is just proof. Right. It's in the, you know, just proves everything. Or we want them to boxes. not have a clue about it. Mm -hmm. And so there are several activities involved. One is a before, prior to the field trip, using a map in the classroom, which we'll demonstrate later. Then as soon as they got off the bus, when they arrived at the site, they did a timeline activity. <clears throat> where they just looked around and they discovered that they could change the date and see changes in the campus itself. And then finally, the junior detective activity where they moved about the site, located evidence, and used the SCIMC scaffold to interrogate that evidence and, and build an account. And we were observing their process along the way, which is really what, what this was about was process. So again, it was um, the, the map activity was really uh, just a short activity in the classroom to get them uh, familiar with using the app itself very briefly. Not a lot of information was provided, but it got them used to the idea of augmentation. So, oh, okay, I point it here and I see these things. And of course, they're ready to go. They didn't need a whole lot of training with that. Uh, these are some of your graduate students, I believe, doing some pilot testing for us. And so you get to see what some of the augmentations to the paper map do. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey guys, this is Detective Grijold. So Detective David just talked to you about uh, Christian Berg Institute. So I'm here to show you this new tool, uh, the map activity. So when you log in into the map, uh, into the app, you'll see this screen. Just start the map activity by tapping on this button. So here is the map that all of you guys have and just point this app, uh, iPad, towards this map, and you'll see all these buildings pop up. So you can actually move the map and all the buildings move with it. Uh, the next tool I want to show you is uh, the timeline tool right here. So you can move this uh, slider to different positions to see how CI changed over time. So in 1900, there's just one building, and as you move, you can see the buildings pop up. Now, there are two types of building in here. Uh, the buildings with black labels and building with green labels. So the, black, uh, the buildings with black label, they're not explorable, so there's no evidence in there. But the green buildings, you can explore those buildings. So let's see what's, uh, what's in the long building. So we tap on it, yes. And you see there is evidence right above the building. So we can tap on it, and then we can analyze it, look around, and then. So we'll do a little hands-on 
when we're, when we're done this morning where you get a chance to do some of that as well. And so this bit here is the, the time slider. So when they get off the bus, they look around the buildings that were developed, they're in place and they can just see them grow as they go. So what, what happens on the map is kind of sets them up for what happens when they get into the field right. as well. And so they get used to that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So then you can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is just um, an overview again of how they interact with the buildings themselves and the evidence within and the scaffold itself. So, you know, you'll tap a label, you go into the building, then you find evidence, and you tap on that evidence, and you can take a look at it, and then you can go through the analysis scaffold, which is a series of questions and a prioritization that you can give each piece of evidence, all based on a very lightened uh, version of the SCIM-C protocol. Yeah. And this, this is x-ray vision, so it's looking into a building that you couldn't get in, and then we have the virtual aspect where there's two buildings there that are models, they tap on them, they actually go inside them and then look around at the, and that's why we talk about it being mixed reality. Right. And that's where they do the same thing, but they'll now be looking at evidence within the building, tapping on this and seeing what's there. So it's a blend of augmented and virtual reality and that, thus the, the mixed reality aspect to it. Yeah. So again, this is the um, evidence um, analysis scaffold. Um, they're, they're led through questions about each piece and, and they respond to those. And we can talk a little more about that in the findings. Um, go ahead. So we had sources based on um, text, uh, school roles, rosters, um, documents, newspaper articles, photographs, and we went through quite a few iterations, really. This is where a lot of the pilot testing came in. So what were the, the best number of sources and types of sources for each of the buildings were? And we tried to localize those to the context of the building. So things that would have been taught by Mrs. Charlton, we put in her classroom in the building. Um, things that were happening in the trades building, which is long since gone, and you explore virtually, we placed there. And then finally, after they explored each of the areas we wanted them to get to, they were then able to unlock a um, set of evidence that really tells the story of why this place disappeared. Because all along they're asking, where is it all? Why is it gone? Um, and we really wanted them to move around the site. We were worried that they would get off the bus and stand in place and just goggle. So we really uh, used a few technical tricks to force them to move around the site. And, most of them moved around in a pretty steady manner. One class went completely feral and just was all over the place running wild, <laughs> which was great, though. I mean, we kept them out of the street, but... Um, <laughs> Running's down the antiperspirant. Yes. So, to speak. Uh, literally, though, we were trying to see different <clears throat> things. So how much, how many primary sources could be used, historical sources, how much freedom do they want? And the first time, we just let them go. We kind of said, now, now look at the time slider, look at this, and there's a, you, there's a video later of kids just running around it's, uh, all over the place. Then it became much more guided. Yes. So there was a guided inquiry. So we managed to move them through different stages as we as we went, just to uh, help move through that type of thing. Go ahead with this. Yeah. Yeah. So like we just said, the instructional cadence it, it could go longer. It was up to the teachers, but we also recognised they've got other things to do. So day one and two is the idea of talking about junior detectives and engaging in history as a mystery. And we gave them like three different kind of um, inquiries that they could do. One was the mystery of Sam Smiley, which is a made up just a general kind of mystery. Uh, the other one was the mystery of the tired old lady, Rosa Parks, not really tired, not really old kind of thing. So we went through that. We also had one on Japanese American internment and then one on break boys. And so, you know, who are these tired and dirty kids? And then they would go through working with sources and they'd be introduced to Skin C. Then they do the in class, they mess with the map and they know they go on a field trip. They have a field trip and literally um, it's, it's about an hour if that, because there is no bathrooms and they were just very, and eventually we had like 12 or 13 classes of uh, fifth graders coming 350 through. 350 or so kids. And they're just like, whoop, whoop, next one, next one flying through. Skin C is just a kind of model that we dealt to work with historical sources. And uh, one thing we also did was we had them, we, we provided them with videos and PowerPoints of uh, just um, uh, they were junior detectives and here's the uh, lead detective, uh, he's a public historian. Dr. David, who he was in charge. So we kind of gave them that type of, uh, and he'd just been asked to name some of their favorite detectives as part of the first day class. Great list. You guys did an awesome job. When I was a kid, you know, my favorite detective was always Sherlock Holmes. I almost forgot. I should properly introduce myself. 
My name is Dr. David Klein, and I'm a history professor at Virginia Tech. But you could just call me Detective David. So you get Phil. So there's Klein. I'll, you know, the bloopers are better. The video as ransom. <laughs> yes, we do. The bloopers <laughs> are way more fun than what he actually did. But the idea is they are, if this place could talk, what would it tell you about life here? They're junior detectives. They then respond to Detective David and they write up their final reports based on that. These were the kind of initial kind of inquiries they got used to. Here is the scaffold that we had introduced to them about what good historians do. Summarize, contextualize, infer, monitor. Then you corroborate, they fill out this form. They can think about their own thinking. So what can they do well? And we kind of give them those type of uh, kind of frames to move through when they think about thinking about analyzing historical sources. We get the map, the timeline, the junior detectives. And then this is where it is. The, the high school's up here. And so we moved through and we took them on Google Street View. Have you ever been to this area? And people go, oh, yeah, that's where the swimming pool is. And they have no concept that just further down and we click through and we just take them to this field and go, that's your field trip. You're not going to Williamsburg this time. You're going to a field with no <laughs> toilets. So it was that type of thing. And then we get into if this place could talk, what would it tell you about? What happens is... When they are in the field and they are accessing buildings, they then, in their virtual backpacks, take notes. So you'll see the photographs, group evidence. This is all group sixes. And then they'll take notes of what is going on while they're there. They then get this back to analyze it and work through when they're doing their final reports. So it's this kind of evidence that gets dropped into their virtual backpack as they're going through each of the buildings and playing with the sources. And these are the kind of prompts. They also highlight which... Um, on a three-star system, is this source useful for the question? So rate it and that type of thing as they go. What we start to get then, they take the evidence and then they would do their uh, write-up, official write-up of what's going on, how we do it. Some of them did posters as well. We also have people doing pr presentations to the uh, school board about what should happen to this site, which some things we didn't expect, mm -hmm. you know, that for them to talk about it should become a museum, things like that. But we were mainly interested in what they learned and how they answered the question. So we tried to do research on this at the same time, since it's a, an NSF grant. And um, we were trying to pay attention to how students learned in situ as you move through it. And some of the research questions were, can we design and implement a mixed reality application? that allows students with little or no knowledge of CI to actually reflect on evidence in situ, leverage the benefits of context as part of engaging in some cultural field work. We also want them to help conceptualize the past and visualize change over time. We also wanted to buy them an experience where we could explicitly scaffold historical thinking and for them to come away saying, oh wow, I didn't even know this was here, it's African American, and, and use evidence and actually use, in their write-up, actually use the evidence rather than just writing anything, like linking what they've seen to actually the final product was something that we really pushed for. The data collection, videotaped observations. So we would, the kids come off and we'd have to identify which kids were allowed to. Everybody's allowed to do this, but we have to know which kids have been given permission to be videotaped, to have their data collected and things like that. We would then have a, a people follow them around with videos and kind of doing think alouds, but they'd be prompted think alouds as they're looking through. Uh, we did student teacher interviews after, student work and documentation. We had positioning attention tracking, and we've still got a lot of that data where how long did they spend in a certain place, what kind of information, and aligning that with the evidence that they've got. And then, yeah, 12 classes of fifth graders uh, who just kept coming. Now, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of data, and it's too much data. So we're having to kind of now just try to take some control over that and take certain classes with what we do. In the case of a field trip where you're actually trying to still be help children, Coming, up, coming off uh, a bus, and the teachers treat it as a field trip, which is what, what the teachers do on a field trip. Stay on the bus and smoke cigarettes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so I have a couple of years on the bus. That's what most American teachers do anyway. So anyway, so that is literally, so we were suddenly working with children, and we're like, what the hell? And, you know, it's all over the place. So teachers sometimes go rogue. Yeah, so they don't follow orders, they give them over, the kids then go rogue too. You spend and, a lot of time on instructional design. You build supporting materials to help the teacher implement what you're planning. Yeah. And then they're on the bus. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. Yeah, the yeah. So we were, you know, we had a lot of issues because we said every child can come, every child can do this. Here we go. And then also uh, at one stage, the Christiansburg Institute um, alumni, 
you know, are involved and new and they help with some of the work. But we didn't want them there because it kind of gives a clue. Right. Spoil a little bit. Spoiler of alert. Yeah. You know, they're all black to right. start with African-Americans who are then talking about when they were at school. And it's like, not now. Yeah. Wait. Go. Until the end. Come, yeah, not yeah. now. Go away. So we had those type of issues that we worked with. But the findings, what we started to use is, so we're looking at the data log usage and we're playing with things like this. And, you know, we, we start to realize in the importance of guided exploration. They give more time with their, with, with the sources when there's a little bit more guiding around, even though we're on a kind of a cadence as you move through. Uh, what we also started to see was that they, the, the, it's, a, it's a short thing, but kids were wanting to see what was going on. They saw it as an inquiry. They recognized it as an inquiry. And the teachers fit liking it, but they, it was the idea of the teachers, I think, really were surprised how quickly the kids handled it, went in and engaged with the materials and stayed sustained and sustained themselves with the materials and with the evidence as they started to unpack as they moved through. So we had the public historian talking about some of how they were talking about the evidence. Now, what they were working with the evidence was important. It was engaging because they had to figure things out. So it was designed in a sense and structurally to do that. Um, we started to see that um, the students were making connections and we caught, kind of talked about it being Newmanism, the idea of walking in the footsteps of others and that sense of that there was a history before here in now what is a derelict site uh, <laughs> and that they could move through and, and, and see things. Um, this is the kind of work that we were that we would see. So this is one child, one group, group eight, writing up, dear Detective David, this is what we found. And here is the evidence. Okay, and so what you start to see is you start to see a line between where they found out material, what, which evidence they used to explain it was an African American school before they knew what they learned, you know, how it closed, which is the final thing that gets unleashed, and they could then refer to that to talk about if this place could talk. Uh, we had that. Um, they, the students afterwards liked, they started talking about using Skim C, they started talking about working with evidence, and these are fifth grade like, kids really talking about playing with evidence and how it works. Uh, we were frustrated at times. Um, we'd get some great write-ups, we'd also get some very basic write-ups as well. So, but one of the things that we were frustrated about, in their virtual backpack, where they were doing all the source analysis, <clears throat> sometimes we would get very little materials. They built a then write, write write about it, but we wanted them to do more analysis in situ. And it was kind of really frustrating. It was a bit of a letdown going, oh, they didn't. We thought they'd do more. But actually, when we saw graduate students do it, they didn't really do much writing about it either. And there wasn't a lot. And then you've got little hands to try to tie. Right. We had like, fifth graders holding these yeah. full-size iPads. And so we wanted them. So we were kind of disappointed at times with the actual, we liked the final products. We felt like they kind of skirted, we would have liked them to do more in situ, but given the time they were there, given the, given the conditions that they were working under with the little hands, it didn't work. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you because when we were observing them, we started to transcribe a lot of the observations. So we're just gonna end with some of these kind of quick observations of, um, of what we started to see. So one, you'll see them inside a virtual building. So they'll be backing around, looking around, and in these ones, this is when they start to realize, this group you'll see, start to realize that it is an African-American school. Based on, they are in the trades building at the time, but we're gonna click this one first, where they just first. Uh... <laughs> go ahead, we're gonna hit trade, and we're gonna go inside. You'll also see feral children right, staggering around in the back and whoop sounds. <laughs> It's inside the building. So they play, I wanted to show you that one because they're actually inside, looking around. They've just accessed an image on cosmetology, and they get the provenance and the dates, and they're starting to look at that. These guys have just gone into the same trade building, which was across the road. Yes. Hi. 
safety first. You can tell how this yellow stopped and being run over. Yeah, we can. So. Suggest that that it was an African American school. Yes, because um, in the other pictures, um, and in some of the uh, things inside of the long building, um, there was some talking about having African Americans here, or just colored people here at the Okay. And the pictures show that they're not white people, although there are some white people in the pictures. Okay. Like, um, they look kind of white, but it's black and white pictures, so it's kind of hard to tell. Okay. Um, so, um, I think this is actually pretty important because all the other things, like the newspaper, mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not the picture especially, but the newspaper is very helpful in telling us that um, it is probably a Negro or colored school. The kids are using the word, it's uncomfortable at times, they're using the word colored, they're using the word Negro, and they talk about it. But the reason why they're doing that is because they're using the evidence from the time. And so it's like they're actually referring to the evidence as they're trying to explain it. And then they, so they shift from Negro to colored to African-American and bounce back and forth. But to me, that is an indication that they are working. They are working with evidence and trying to pull it together. And then the, we've, we've done things we teach about having a discussion of how we and again, that kind of thing. It's the same thing again here. Yeah. And then we can. Oh, look. So we're going to use that. Okay. And this child's just been confused by a black and white photo because he keeps calling it a mixed race school because it's a black and white photo. No. This team does look like a bunch like that. I'm not seeing a timeline. We're going to get it quick. Yeah, um, so, what do you notice? Know? You, you, you guys were looking at a basketball photo, right? Yeah. So, what does that tell you about Christian Bergen? So, you talked about this. They found a basketball team. But what do you mean we're back at the map activity? We heard this something about they only played black teams. So, they might have been a black school. And then on the barber picture we saw yesterday, it was also called black. What does that tell you that about Christian Bergen Institute? Probably like the black school. When, when, what period do we talk? And so it sounds, it, it's trivial, but it's fifth graders not knowing anything about this local history, this invisible history of an African American school. And at the same time, which is where it gets kind of ironic, they're up above, which is at the school where they, where, um, 
integration occurred, mm -hmm. there is the KKK this week up there supporting students over a Confederate flag issue. And so we have all these little fifth graders going down, learning about this African-American school that's just below them. And at the same time, there's problems up at the, up at the school and there's actually a, a performance going. And so a performance or a, well, it was a performance. Yeah. Um, so that's where we're at with some of this data, but we're playing with the data in a sense to do engagement first, see how they unpack the data and how you're using mixed reality just as a quick way in to play and unpack and make visible the invisibles we've talked about. We've, we've come across the idea of uh, the importance of limited sources, using engagement first. So the idea that we don't want them to know the answers, we want them to struggle through and play in a very uh, tight, uh, tight way. The importance of having scaffolding. Though I was scaffolding while they played with it, they didn't do as much as we would have liked them to do. But now we're thinking about voice dictation being layered in. And so what they're talking about can be recorded rather than their little fingers of fifth graders working. The importance of actually integrating into a curriculum with goals and around teachers, having teachers work with us on this. And the importance also of the effective aspect of just walking in the footsteps of others, of recognising it's important. And then it's also just beyond digital, though. So what we ended up doing was then we actually took this and um, it became a, an exhibit. So all the exhibits and all the sources that were there, also plus more, you look too much over there, but were, were then used in an exhibit at the, um, at the university. At the same time, the school is also came in and the teachers, you'll see some of the teachers and students, there was a group at the high school then who also created their own exhibit at the high school for the Christiansburg Institute. And so it doesn't have to be about digital technology. It's about just creating an exhibit and sharing. And then the school where there was the issues of the Confederate flag now has a section where there is a museum that was designed by teachers, by the students, based on some of the work that we've been doing and playing with them. So that's really the broader aspects piece of an NSF grant where you're doing a study trying to look at certain affordances you're building and it becomes something that the community latches onto and, and, and uh, yeah, so we have the high school students working together to make an exhibit, but we have teachers today who still want to come back, some of the same teachers and additional ones, yeah. who would like to come back and continue using it as a field trip and an activity in their curriculum outside of our study. So it is interesting in that way, and it, and it brings up issues of um, sustainability of your research. You build something that you don't want to be a one and done because it's, it's a community engagement piece. But then the practical aspects become how do we sustain this so that people can continue using it? We're, we're thrilled that people want to use it. We're less than thrilled that only four of the iPads still work. I blame my graduate students though. So what happened was <laughs> the day before, so the week before, right, yes. we met with the teachers. This, this happened this semester. The graduate students all came out and we showed them as part of a digital humanities class. They were playing with all this stuff. And I think when it popped up, they updated everything. So, you know, they updated the, oh, let's just hit update. Right. And then the next minute we were with the teachers and we were practicing it with we the were teachers. in the field. And Thank God there was no children. Yeah. But it didn't work. So we've got far working. It's going to get fixed. And then we'll be <laughs> continuing to play with it and, uh, and, and have that uh, as part of it. So a lot of the work is about, you know, using mixed reality. But it's with curriculum. It's trying to put learning first. It's playing with this idea of making the invisible visible, as I keep saying. And uh, that's it. Right? And this is Mumford and Sons. Is it Mumford and Sons? I'm going to close it because I don't know what's going on next. There we go. So, thank you. What time?